30 seconds to yeah. air. Actually, flowers I think we should have the teaser for the guest. Uh, hey, I'm going to need someone books for these mics. Anyone have the promo for the show notes? Is this, wait, where's the Fiji water? Is this, this isn't, is this tap water? 15 seconds. Can somebody get the cat? I can't drink tap water. Grab the cat. Can, can, can someone tell Joe's mom to stop vacuuming? Bottle. It's not hard to find. Has anybody this seen feet. my hair gel? Tesian water. Natural. Quiet on the set. Live in three, two. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and prepare to get into that thing you keep telling everybody you're going to do, invest in real estate. Let's welcome investor and co-host of the Stacking Deeds Real Estate Podcast, Crystal Hammond. Plus, a lady who knows a thing or two about investing herself, it's Paula Pant. And rounding out the panel is the genius behind the appliance every homeowner has, and I mean every homeowner, the inventor of the Instant Pot. Now, oh, never mind, he's out writing his book. I think he's on chapter 11. Instead, we sandwiched in Len Penzo. See what I did there? But that's not all. Halfway through the show, I'll share my out-of-this-world trivia question. And now, a guy who knows how to find a deal, it's Joe Saul Cihai. Especially a deal on used board games. That's where the money's made, Doug. I think that's where the money is. Did you see the article recently about a new board game bar that opened up and it said they have over 500 board games? And I thought, Joe's just got that in his basement closet <laughs> like he had to have laughed at this <laughs> amateurs yes isn't that cute that's so cute no let's talk frugality for the win podcast everybody i'm joe saul ci ever joe money on twitter and we are not diving into the wonderful world of board games we're diving into real estate the game so let's introduce the panel who's here with doug and i today the guy who's deep under los angeles in his real estate bunker Mr. Len Penzo's here. How are you, man? I'm great. I'm a little surprised you have me on this episode because you know I never bet on real estate. Never. Well, that's actually why we have you on instead of OG because we wanted the everyman, the kind of counter to the other two pros that are on the show. I so. was kind of hoping... I was kind of hoping you'd ask me why I never bet on real estate, Joe. Oh, <laughs> I totally <laughs> swing and a miss. I guess we need to rehearse this before the show starts. <laughs> I never bet on real estate, Joe. I'm surprised you had me on the show. Len, why don't you bet on real estate? Because the house always wins. <laughs> oh. Oh, Hold on, goodness. wait. And Doug's saying yes, this has been much better yeah. if we... <laughs> so good. So good. <laughs> Should I do the credits now? Because everybody's about to check out of this show. You want me to just skip to the end? Because we're losing them. Well, let's do it. We're going to hurry on. And from uh, the wonderful Manhattan, Mile High Real Estate. How many floors up are you, Paula? Paula Pants here. <laughs> That's Manhattan, New York, not Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, although I'm not Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> although both, I'm sure, are great. Uh, 20 stories high. And. Um, oh. Oh, you know, that's what I was going to say. Joe, you should, given the number of board games you have, just get a liquor license for your home. Oh, there it is. Right? Then yes. your home could double as a board game bar. Paula's got the side hustle down. But, Paula, I do have to ask, because mm -hmm. you were talking about the difference between Manhattan, New York, and Manhattan, Kansas. How many times have you ever had to go, uh-huh, no, the other Manhattan? <laughs> Like, have you had to do that before? <laughs> Not yet, but I mean, you know, middle America is rising, uh, you know, growing you're, bigger you're, and more popular than ever. You're not talking to enough K-State fans then, I guess. That must be must be the deal. Not yet. Not yet. I'm sure people from <laughs> Portland have to do that. Which Portland? No, no, the, the one in Maine. I actually have a friend who bought a ticket accidentally to the oh. wrong Portland and went there and loved it. <laughs> just just decided we bought the wrong ticket. Let's go. So that was their first trip to Portland, Oregon. Wow. Was, uh, That's fantastic. Had a great time. Speaking of fantastic, guess who's here, Paula? Who's here? Crystal Hammond is here from So So Fabulous and, of course, our sister show, Stacking Deeds. How are you, Crystal? 
I'm wonderful. How's everybody doing? Like, speaking of betting, you know, the casinos uh, during the pandemic, they had to fix all the games so that they made a large amount of money on a smaller population of people. So Lynn knows the house always wins. <laughs> like, literally. <laughs> this is public information, too. You can look this up. <laughs> See, thank you, Chris. Crystal actually learned something from my little joke while you guys are all mocking me. <laughs> Crystal... Actually learn something. Who would mock Thank your you, jokes, Chris. Len? Nobody would. By the way, nah. uh, Crystal, you and Len were both at the first FinCon together. Paula, were you yeah. at the first FinCon? I was there too. Yeah, Schaumburg. Yep. Schaumburg, See? Illinois. Yep, Schaumburg. 2011. How about that? Yeah, how many people were there? There was like 20 of there, us. There were around 200. <laughs> yeah. Was, was there? there? Yeah. But, that should be uh-huh. the trivia question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's when you guys need to band together and go, I think there were three. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like this is that that first REM concert where there were actually it was in a basement and there were like seventy five people there, but like seventy five thousand have told Michael Stipe right. they were all there for the very first <laughs> one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it t- totally, I was there. I was totally yeah, there. Totally there. Uh, Crystal, for people that haven't heard it yet, tell everybody about the Stacking Deeds podcast. What happens? So you get to learn all about buying your first piece of investment property. We want people to um, get out of the comfort zone. Like we want people to learn from stories of, hey, I want to get into real estate investing. How do I do that? And I am a part timer, so I love my full time job. So I'm just in it as a part timer uh, investing in real estate. And if this girl from the south side of Chicago can do it, Anybody can do it. So we're just sharing a lot of stories of how people are doing it. You can find it where greater podcasts, better podcasts are distributed. That's everywhere. We got, uh, <clears throat> we've got Crystal here. We got Len here. Oh, you have your badge from the first FinCon. Wait, for you, those... you have it like with you at your desk such that you didn't actually have to get out of your chair to produce it? Lynn. We, we get a life, man. <laughs> I, I kept all my badges. I kept all my FinCon badges. But literally Aww. within arm's reach. Right. <laughs> yes, Paula, there, if, there you'd was... have by my, if you'd have stopped by my house when you were out here in Southern California last year, you'd have seen that. <laughs> Hold on a second, guys. While we talk to Len about the problems with hoarding everybody can listen to this hold on u.s cellular has some great news especially for you person listening to this podcast right now you can get one line with unlimited data for just 29.99 so unlike other cell networks you won't have to pay for lines you don't need just to get a good price get one line for 29.99 with unlimited data today U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply. Visit uscellular.com for details. Len, hold on. That's only half of it. Let's get people one more while we finish this. But after that, Len, remember buying a car for the first time, OG? It isn't actually much less exciting now. Like every time I have a different ride, I'm like, that's cool. Or even if a friend of mine gets a ride, it's cool. Getting a new car can be exciting, whether it's a new car or new to you car. You deserve a hassle-free buying experience. And that's why Navy Federal Credit Union makes each step of the car buying process simple with all you need all in one place. From start to finish, Navy Federal's Car Buying Center has everything you need to research, finance, buy, protect, and enjoy your next car. You could search for new and used cars, access vehicle history reports, and enjoy discounts on auto insurance and more. Now, if you have a new car... What about the new home that you park it at? Let's say you move, you got a new house. Well, Navy Federal has you covered there too. They made it their mission to help military members and their families tackle home ownership. You guys know already how much I love their new no refi rate drop option. You buy a home now, and if rates drop later, you could then lower your rate without refinancing. That can save you so, so, so much money. And not just, by the way, in refinance costs, It will save you a ton of money in the amortization table. It's so amazing. I just love that. Plus, they also offer mortgage options with zero down payment, so you don't need to wait years to save. At Navy Federal, our members are the mission. Find out more at NavyFederal.org. So, Len, that's why you don't keep all that stuff in your desk. It's a fire hazard. That, that. <laughs> no. I yeah. think Lynn has been banished to just one room, so he has all of his stuff <laughs> just in that one space. <laughs> Is that why Lynn stopped going to FinCon? Was because he had too too much stuff at the desk? 
swag. It's called swag. There you go. Correct. Len's Len's about to pull out some Ally Bank cookies. (laughs) You know, the pancake. You know, I do have a few of those those things. (laughs) Oh, goodness. We got Len Penzo here, right, with his petrified cookies. Crystal Hammett's here. Paula Pan's here. Let's get the party started. This piece, which we found on Entrepreneur Magazine, uh, written by Ari Shazanaz, which sounds like a made-up name, Shazanaz, doesn't it? That's a great name. I want to. I want that name. <laughs> Didn't Mork say that when, like, he stubbed yes. his toe? Didn't he go Shazanaz? I, I don't know. But Ari Shazanaz writes: Few industries are better for first-time investors than real estate. Here are four proven ways to make a profit. Well, we're going to dive into these four ways a little later in the show. But Chris, I want to start with you. Few industries are better for first-time investors than real estate. When you think of places to invest, do you agree with that statement that, that real estate's the first place to look or close to the first place to look? I feel like it's the path of least resistance. I think it has a low barrier to entry. And we talk about this on the show all the time. We all need somewhere to live, right? And that's one thing. And a second thing, we've all had horrible landlords. Like we can do a better job, a 10 times better job than 90% of our landlords. So since we all need a place to live, I think owning the place to live and then being a landlord for others, like being an example That's a path of least resistance because you're just buying a house and then you're going to rent it out or buying an apartment. You can live in one unit and you can rent out the other unit. I don't think you've ever been a landlord. Have you? Have you ever been a landlord? Um, I'm trying to think back in college. Did I? No. No. I know <laughs> well, you charged your kids rent when they were like nine years old, so that counts, Len. <laughs> Len's like I was in college; I was just experimenting with real estate. <laughs> no, I told you I don't bet on the house, Joe. Len's Did you like know was... horrible landlords? Did you have a horrible landlord? You know what? I used to live next door to a slumlord. I, I did. I there was a slumlord lived next door to me. But Len, do you think then, as somebody who hasn't invested in real estate? Do you agree with this title? Few industries better for first-time investors than real estate. Well, I would say it depends if you're talking about, uh, I don't know. I guess, I, frankly, I, I you can't argue with real estate. The returns over the long term are phenomenal. I do believe that if you're just starting out, you might want to try something actually with a lower barrier to entry than real estate. You know, they also shows good long-term returns, but- like what? Like what would that be? What are you talking about? I think the stock market. The stock market shows good long, re- long and and it doesn't take you know a hundred or two hundred or three hundred thousand dollar loan to get in. But I'm not going to sit here and and say that real estate has poor returns because it the evidence shows that it it has great returns if you're you know willing to hold. And you only need three percent down. You don't need the whole hundred, two hundred, three hundred. But still, it's a lot more crystal on the table than than an index fund. But that's like your uh, your security deposit. Yeah. But what do you mean? The 3% down? Yeah. Or the, the amount? No, I'm saying you can get into an index fund, though, way cheaper, though, than you can into a piece of primary property. Oh, yeah. That's Paula, true. Paula, where do you come down on that? I don't think it's particularly good for the majority of beginners because I think the majority of beginners don't know what they're doing, assume that they know how to make money in real estate, and due to their lack of education – they make huge, huge mistakes. And what I mean by this is a lot of people think that because they can do something at the personal amateur level, they assume that means they'll be able to make money at it. In no other industry do we routinely do this. We don't assume that because we know how to play tennis on the weekends, that means we know how to play pro tennis. We don't assume that because we know how to cook our own dinner, that means we know how to be a chef a professional chef. We don't assume that because we can drive a car, that qualifies us to drive at the Indy 500. Unless you're Doug. there are a lot of people. Sorry. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) Doug's like, I'm in Indianapolis right now. (laughs) (laughs) But yet with housing, we assume that just because we have purchased a personal residence for ourselves, or we know someone who has, that that means that we know what we're doing. And I see a lot of people make these mistakes. They'll think, oh, if the rent covers the mortgage, I'll be fine. 
or they don't know what cap rate means, um, or they don't have some kind of a critical opinion about the relative merits of cash on cash return, right? If you don't know the basics, then you should learn first. But you know what, Paul? Here's, here's one thing I'll say about that, and you're absolutely right, but I think a lot of people get misled by, I'll say, the media. I will hear on the radio or see on TV ads for get into this, you know, real estate, make a quick dollar and do this. Or people watch those home flipping shows and stuff on TV and it looks so, they make it look so easy. They don't show how, you know, all the work that really goes into it and all the risks that could come up. So I, I think a lot of people get, they get misled into thinking that it's easy, you know? Well, if you use TV as your teacher, you're gonna you're gonna fail. Well, of course, in, of course. I mean, and that's true of pretty much anything. If you think that you can watch, uh, you know, a television show in which all of the characters are like buff and jacked and like you know super super fit, and then but then you watch their their daily habits on the TV show, and they're never meal prepping, they're never working out, you know, they're never doing anything. They just like were born ripped, you know. I I mean, it's like it's completely fictional it's fictionalized yes. that's what that's literally what television is but does that mean though paula because back to you know back to crystal's point there's some really crappy landlords out there you actually even made that point there's a bunch of idiots that invest in real estate we talk about the stock market about being an efficient market does that mean in real estate because of the moron factor that it isn't an efficient market which means this headline may be correct that it is a good place with a little education to to make some money I do think it's an inefficient market, but I don't think it's because of the moron factor, because the reality is that the number of individual investors who are landlords is relatively incredibly small compared to the number of institutional investors who own both multifamily and single family homes. I'm thinking about Blackstone. I'm thinking invitation homes, right? I'm thinking about these private equity backed corporate landlords that really drive a big piece of the market. So shadow banking is where you see the majority of, of, of rental ownership, um, particularly post-Great Recession. And that has its own inefficiencies. That has its own problems. But that's not the moron factor at the mom and pop level. I also come down as I read this, I thought the title was ridiculous. In so many of these media titles, they just make it sound way easier than it than it is, which is why I think you need to have good information when you get started. I, I certainly don't know that um, I need to know what's going on with shadow banking to make <laughs> to, to become a good <laughs> landlord to buy a couple properties. But if we compared it to another side gig, so instead of talking about it as an investment, instead we talk about it as a side gig. At the risk of having Paula dominate the first few minutes of this show, I just want to go back to you because you were the voice on one end. If we compare it to a different side gig, is that better than comparing it to uh, a different investment? I think at a minimum, when you use the word side gig, not that I would agree with that statement, even if you were to substitute those words, but at a minimum, the phrase side gig at least implies that you're going to, to some extent, have to learn what you're doing. Like, even if you love candles, if you wanted to learn how to open an e-commerce store so that you could sell candles on Etsy or eBay or Amazon, you would most likely, I would hope, maybe take an online course about how to run an Amazon shop, right? You would uh, read a few books about it. You would, you would learn the mechanics of it. And so I think that at a minimum, there is, with that substitution, some implication of you have to actually learn what you're doing. This is to be able to make money at something is a very different ballgame than just doing it at the personal level for your own personal consumption. And I definitely agree with Paula. So my view of what a side hustle is, it's like you want to get paid for doing something that you already do. It's something you already like, you already love, but you do need to take classes and get education on how to make money, how to set up your store, how to run your business. And that's the same for real estate for me. My, my mentality is... You already need a place to stay, so why not provide housing for you and others? And you're going to do the same thing. You're going to set up your business. You're going to surround yourself with people that are doing it already, that are making money from it already, that are good at it, and they're going to give you the advice, the tools, or you're going to go to school for it to learn the proper ways so that you don't make mistakes or you hear about all the mistakes and you get to learn from them and you have your systems in place that are foolproof. 
Well, Crystal, and I, you're not a fool. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. In your headline segment, you guys go through some of the speaking about the moron factor about people that don't treat it like they need to be educated, like in the horror stories of people that uh, get in over their head. Well, there are, and we love like in the industry people, insiders. We love to share horror stories for people to learn. We love to share when we get screwed by people. Hey, these are the people to avoid. These are companies that have we've had these particular experiences with. It doesn't say you're going to have the same experience, but now you at least know, hey, before you go in, before you get a contract, here are some questions you need to ask, or here are some terms you need to include in certain orders or work orders or, you know, how you're going to do business. And even tenants, there's things that you can put in leases. You can say, you can't paint my uh, walls technicolor, you know, so you can add whatever oh, you want to your I'm not lease. not staying there. <laughs> and you want to filter people out. So it, it's a matter of filtering for, you know, your preference because you want to make your life as easy and uh, cookie cutter as possible, I would say, because, you know, oh, look at Paula's cat. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Cameo, cat cam. Yeah, you, you, you want to make things as seamless as possible. Like no news is good news. No surprises. Like you want to plan for a scenario, plan A, B, C, D, and just have a plan for it. Hey, if a pipe bursts, here's my plan for it. This is the plumber I'm going to call. And this is the amount of money I set aside per month just for emergencies or pipe bursts. Because if I'm buying a brand new house, I don't expect a pipe to burst. But if I'm buying an old home, you know, I need to set aside money for which, which I think, Len, brings me back to my rant earlier about Ari's title here. Few industries are better for first time investors than real estate. Both Crystal and Paula talked about all these things that could go wrong. I, I, I could go buy an index fund. Like, I just want, I just would wish that this sometimes real estate investors would realize that this phrase passive income we use when we talk about buying real estate property is complete BS. It's not passive. It isn't passive at all. It's not. I have a good friend who he has um, – when he sold his condo uh, many years ago, he said he decided – well, instead of selling it, he decided that he would rent it because he bought a new home. And so, he, and he's had that thing for 20 years. And he's had some – I mean, yes, he's had side income from it, but boy, he's had some issues over the years. He's had – he had a tenant that completely destroyed the inside of his his condo. I mean – by the time he got the guy out, all the fixtures were ruined. The rugs were destroyed. The walls had holes in them. And it took him like six months just to get that thing to even – and a lot of money to get it looking good. And I was thinking, my God, is that really worth all the headaches? And I'm the type of person – I'm not that handy around the house. And I don't want to – you know, I just – to me, it's a lot of work. I'm not – obviously, you can make money at it. And a lot of – many, many people do. But I think there's a lot of other ways to make money on the side. I think there's – for new investors, I think there's way less expensive, less risky avenues to get into for investing. So there's obviously a lot to like about real estate. Paula, what is it we should be selling? If we're selling, re instead of selling it as best place for beginners to begin, mm -hmm. what should we be selling about real estate investing that uh, you don't see enough? So it is the type of asset that you buy when you want an income play or, you know, something that's analogous to a dividend play. Uh, it is a cash producing asset. That form of return has a very different composition, meaning like, a, you know, when you buy any asset, that asset is going to earn returns in one of two ways. Either it's going to go up in value, which is called appreciation, or it's going to produce an income stream, which is sometimes known as a dividend. Or in the case of housing, uh, that's your rental income, including principal pay down, there's cash flow. One is going in, into the form of equity growth. The other is going into literal cash in your bank account. But either way, you're getting income from that, right? So when you buy assets, generally, you ultimately want to have a mix of different types of assets. Some assets, you want that appreciation play. You want to be the person who bought NVIDIA back in uh, 2020, right? Just to, to enjoy the appreciation, right? That, that, that's one characteristic of one type of asset. Real estate just has a very different set of characteristics. And so if you want some diversification in your portfolio, real estate is a way to achieve that. Crystal, I think you and I might have gotten into real estate in a similar way. Uh, tell us your, your real estate story. How did you become a landlord? Well, I I became a landlord. It's funny. So the apartment that I grew up in was the the landlord was selling it. My mom still lived in one of the units. And it was weird because friends of mine went to uh, real estate meetings. And I was like, can I go with you to your meetings? 
I just wanted to meet someone and I was like, hey, can you buy this building and not raise my mom's rent? That was my goal. And they were like, why don't you buy it? And that's how I ended up buying the building. Someone was just like, why don't you buy the... So I ended up buying it. I ended up... My mom lived in a unit. I lived in a unit. So, you know, we were both paying the super cheap mortgage. Like her rent went down. Mine went way down. So it was it was a huge win-win situation for me. But yeah, that's how I ended up getting my first piece of real estate, my first duplex. But wow. at that point, based on all the things that you need to know, I mean, to then take that and then parlay that into being even more of a landlord, I would think that your engineering brain had to kick in and now you're, 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 you're trying to learn all this stuff afterwards. Oh yeah. I had to take a landlord class like, and you learned a lot during that class. And that first meeting that I went to, it was a real estate round table. So I went to more and more meetings every single month when they had their meetings. I went to every meeting and I learned like from all the people that were in the industry in the know, like, you know, they would talk about the rehabs they were doing or whatever projects they were working on, what they closed on and how much everything cost. So I surrounded myself with people who were in real estate and giving me numbers of, oh, this is uh, the zip code and this is how much rent I'm charging in this neighborhood. This is where I go to find tenants, you know? So it was just a, an information sharing kind of meeting amongst a small group that were there every week. And if anybody was dumb enough to screw over anybody in the meeting, they wouldn't be back, you know, and that word would get around. So it was like, I started by just saying, hey, I have a real estate problem. Let me find some real estate people in my comfort zone, you know, my friend zone to help with it. Len, do you see yourself now, I mean, as an experienced investor and uh, someone that finally maybe has some time on their hands, do you see yourself going into rental real estate? No. The only thing I see myself doing, me personally in real estate, uh, when the time comes for me to sell this house, I think what I'm going to try and do is sell this house to somebody and have them carry back the loan. So that way... Uh, you know, that'll be kind of like my, just a different way of handling things. That's the only thing I, I would do. Are you saying you want to be the mortgage holder? What are you saying? Yeah, I'd be the mortgage holder. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're Len the slumlord. Is that what you're saying? And then I'm the... <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're May, We'll see. I don't know. It's just something I, I, you know what? I'll leave it to the pros. I'll leave it to Paula sure. and Crystal and everybody else to do that stuff. That's just not my thing. So Crystal, how much did you jack up the rent on mom? <laughs> no, I did not. Like, <laughs> I did not have to. The mortgage was so low. I was like, wow, these people hadn't had a mortgage for years and they were still collecting the same amount of rent, too. Yeah, but that That's doesn't, another beauty. It doesn't stop some people from going, hey, mom, I, I don't know what happened. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm sorry. Yeah, we just have to raise the rent. I'm just, no. Uh, coming up next, we're going to dive into their four different ways that they talk about, about buying real estate. We're going to dive into those as well. Everything from flipping to house hacking to more. So we will do those in just a moment. But at the halfway point of every show, if you're brand new here, we have this uh, fairly ridiculous uh, trivia competition between your long competition between our three frequent contributors, our co-host OG, who has the week off. So Crystal, you are on team OG this week. Uh, Mr. Penzo and uh, Ms. Paula Pant. And uh, Crystal, we've got some good news and some bad news for you about the score so far. Which one would you like first? I would like the bad news. Well, the bad news is, is that OG has won the last two years in a row, but he is not in first place now. He is tied oh. for second, which means Loser. you are going to... <laughs> which means we're, you not, are going, we're not Crystal. <laughs> you are going to be picking second. Uh, Len has nine, which means he's going to go first. OG with seven is former champ. That means he has to guess ahead of Paula, who also has seven. Paula's been back for two weeks, is still not descended into last place, which How is like a, that? a <laughs> high five for Paula. Not last place. <laughs> but to Only answer tied the, for last. <laughs> to see, well, it's tied for second. Let's phrase it <laughs> on the positive end. Glass is half full, Paula. Yes. Tied for second out of three. <laughs> but to find out who's going to win this week's uh, competition, we need to have a question. And Doug's got that. Doug, what's today's trivia question? Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And something big is going down here in the neighborhood. Somebody new is moving in, but not just anybody. It's a woman. And if Joe's mom isn't lying, she's single. It's about time. We need a lady to class up this dude, Burb. 
I've got to mark this day on the calendar so I'll remember our anniversary. Speaking of the other big days with a bang, today in 1908, an unidentified object believed to be an asteroid caused a 12 megaton explosion. Kind of like Len's last trip to Taco Bell. But this <laughs> was near... Hold on, I can't pronounce this. This is... It's, it's, it was near the Podkamenaya Tunguska River in Russia... There's, there's, I don't know, there's vodka nearby, and flattened an estimated 80 million trees. Well, that rings true. The incident is known as the Tunguska event, which is the largest impact in recorded history, even though there's no impact crater because it's believed the object exploded three to six miles above the Earth. It's estimated that the asteroid was 160 to 200 feet in size and traveled at a speed of 60,000 miles per hour before leveling everything in its path for miles. You guys were taking notes, right? There's a lot of numbers in there. Did you carry the one? Okay. No. But here's the question. How many square miles of land did the asteroid destroy? I'll be back right after I go ask my new neighbor if she needs help assembling her furniture. You know, maybe tables, chairs, possibly a bed or two. But it's the neighborly thing to do. Don't look at me like that. Oh, boy. Nothing better than having (laughs) Doug scare away the new neighbor already on day one. Thank you very much. But we won't uh, go into that. Let's chat about this trivia question. Len, you have the honor of going first. 60,000 miles an hour. Asteroid. Blew up between 160 and no, uh, three to six miles above Earth. How many miles or acres? Miles? Square How miles? many square miles of land did it Gosh. destroy? I'd say, I, I have no idea. If I say 50 miles by 50 miles, what is that? That's, uh, would that be right? Would that make sense? 50 miles by 50 miles? Yeah, let me just go up. I'll, I'll just make the math easier. 100 miles by 100 miles would be, what's that? 100. Times 100, add zero. Well, so that's 10,000? 10, 10,000 miles. 10,000 were square miles, right? Yep. yep. And then I'll split the difference. 7,500 square miles. 7,500 square miles. Crystal, what are you thinking? Let's see. I'm thinking bigger because you did mention Taco Bell. <laughs> uh, <this> is gross. <laughs> Definitely bigger than that if someone's going to Taco Bell. Uh, so... Definitely on the scale of, I like how you were doing the math there, Lynn. So I'm going to go with 50,000 square miles because that is, I feel like, yeah, beans. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Imagine some beans coming at you at 60,000 miles per hour. Horrifying. It's horrifying. (laughs) It's It's a bad day. That's my final answer, 50,000. But if you had a day I, like that where you blew up 50,000 <laughs> square miles? <laughs> Ask his plumber. <laughs> Just, uh, his very well-paid plumber. <laughs> I do have a Taco Bell card in my wallet. I'll say that. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so is my well, Paula, with those two, you got, you got 7,500 and 50,000. You've got a wide field goal there. <laughs> yeah, I sure do. Um, so you, uh, you said 80,000 trees were decimated. Is that right? 80 million. 80 million. 80 million, oh, 80 million trees. 80 Gosh, that was a key. Million. That was a key. I should have listened to that a little more closely. If I had known that 80 million trees, my goodness. 80 million. 80 million uh, trees. I guess I missed that part. Let have you ever killed 80 million trees after going to Taco Bell? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if it's eight, because I'm, I'm just thinking about how much space would 80 million trees take up? Yeah, exactly. I, I, miss, I totally missed that. Who measured? They estimated. Yeah, yeah. what if it was only 79 million? Who, who counted the trees? That's yeah. right. <laughs> they, you know what they said? They said there's this many, normally this many trees in a square mile of land, and it's this many square miles, and that's how many trees got decimated. Mm, okay, yeah, sure. So, so truly, this boils down to how many trees are in a square mile of land, uh, and I don't know the answer to that. So that doesn't help at all. More than one. <laughs> I do love though. While you're wondering, Paula, I do love Crystal making under protest. Who counted? Like she wants the name. <laughs> Bill it's not, counted. It's not Bill, accurate. Bill Can't be counted. Crystal. It was Bill. <laughs> I'm coming for you, Bill. Crystal, your answer was 50,000? 50, 50,000. 50,000 square yeah, miles. Probably undershot. 
I'm pro- I'm going to capture the upside. So fifty thousand and one. Fifty thousand and one. Paula <laughs> using the same methodology she's used for years, and it hasn't worked yet. So, right. We'll see. <laughs> today could be we'll could, today could be the day. <laughs> yes, we're going to let you know in just a second. Len, you kick this shindig off with 7,500 uh, square miles. What are you thinking? Yeah, that's terrible. I, I think I way underestimated. I, I, I totally missed. I must have blacked out when Doug was talking about the 80 million trees, <laughs> trees because I think I would have come in way higher if that was. But what are you going to do? Crystal, 50,000, but Paula took the upside. What are you thinking? Yeah, I think it's way higher. And and similar to Lynn, when people tell long stories, I lose interest. So I need, <laughs> exactly. to, I need, to, <laughs> exactly. I need to abbreviate it version. What I remember the, the first thing and the last it thing. It is amazing how Crystal Hammond can lose interest halfway through a story, but she can n- notice the cat very quickly. <laughs> yeah, that woke me point up. Out the, point out the difference. And Paula, you've got 50,001. Yeah, well, you know, as soon as he said the number of trees, I was like, that's... That's going to be important. But then I thought it was 80,000. So I'm glad that we clarified that it's actually 80 million. Well, was it as important as we thought? Only one person knows. Doug, who's our winner? Hey there, stackers. I'm welcome wagon driver and home inspector, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I'm talking about one of the biggest impacts in recorded history known as the Tunguska event, where an asteroid with the wingspan of a Boeing 777 exploded a few miles above a sparsely populated area of Russia along the Tunguska River before it hit Earth. The shockwave knocked people off their feet hundreds of miles from the explosion. Again, we're back to Lynn at Taco Bell. (laughs) My question was, how many square miles of land did the asteroid destroy? Well, this was a really close one. Our contestants here really zeroed in on a great mathematical equation. Uh, Paula was only off by 49,171 square miles, which means Crystal was off by 49,170. But this is the shocker. Len was only off by 6,670 square miles because the answer, you spatially challenged people, was 830 square miles. Or to put it in money terms, it destroyed over a billion dollars worth of timber. Listen, 830 square miles is sort of like what? 40 by 40? I don't know. That's about the size of uh, Joe's property in his ho- at his house where he lives there, right? I That's- thought those could be another game collection joke. It's about the size of Joe's yeah. game collection. Uh, yes. Come on. No. If you stack all his games up, probably, that's how probably, tall it is. Probably not. Len Penzo pulls further ahead. Wow. Congrats. Congrats. Yeah, so just picture an impact area 40 miles from where you are. And 20 miles wide. That's 800 square miles. That's still a pretty major. That's a that's a lot of trees. That, yeah, that many trees. Yeah, but you were selling it, Doug. You were selling it. You were like, oh, it's 80. this big. And blah, 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 blah. I'm a professional, like, Len. It's what I do. 80 million <laughs> trees? Maybe if you think of like a vineyard, think of a wine. I guess trees are close together. I, I found out we lost we lost trees at one of the golf courses in Texarkana. We lost, I think it was like 350 trees on the golf course. And I was wow. out there a month afterwards Damn. and didn't notice a tree missing. Like it was oh there God. were mm. there were so many trees gone, but there's far more trees, I think, than we know. I think is the mm. might yeah. be the might be the point here. I don't know. The bigger point is, let's move on. How about that? The <laughs> yes, second let's. Half of this discussion is brought to you by depositaccounts.com. <laughs> Paul, you know what happens when you go to Paul's, po, de, blah, depositaccounts.com? <laughs> you find out that the ordinary deposit accounts that you get are nowhere near the best in class. Nowhere near. Amen, sister. Savings accounts right now, according to depositaccounts.com. This is just over a week before people are going to hear it. Top 1% paying 4.44% APY. Top CDs, top 1%, 5.35%. Listen to this, that national average 3.41% versus 5.35. Versus three. Wow. <laughs> Jeez. Leave that in, Steve. I, yeah. yeah, it's not so easy, is it, Joe? <laughs> Versus 5.35% APY for CDs. Checking accounts, top 1% average, 2.43%. Money markets, 4.23% for the top 1%. Head to depositaccounts.com and uh, let's get that savings account moving at least a little bit. Try to keep up with inflation a little, people. All right, speaking of keeping up, we are going to keep up with the four top ways 
of investing in real estate that they have uh, in this piece. Let's dive into these. Number one on this list they have is house hacking. Paula, would you say house hacking, the number one place, easiest place for a new person to start in real estate? 100% yes, because with house hacking, uh, and to people who aren't familiar with that term, that's the process of buying a property and renting out a portion of it. So it might be that you buy, for example, a duplex, you live in one unit, you rent out the other. It might be that you buy a single family home and you just rent out the other bedrooms to roommates. Could be that you buy a fourplex and you rent out three of the other units. Wait, 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 wait. wait. I think I get it, Paul. So (laughs) if I have a fiveplex, I can rent out (laughs) four? Well, well, you could, but you're going to have a hard time getting a fiveplex because five units is considered a, a commercial Commercial. property. And so you would need a completely different type of loan. You would need a oh, commercial loan. Oh my snap. goodness. Glenn tried to come in and be all sarcastic and you just <laughs> threw it down. Steve, I love Steve, it. cut that and we'll start over. <laughs> I thought I had the algorithm too, Len. I thought I saw the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. For residential, you max out at four, which is why, Joe, to your original question, why house hacking is a great place for a beginner is because you can get that residential loan as long as you are buying four or fewer units. You can get the same type of loan that you would get as any type of primary resident owner-occupant. And that's the easiest type of loan to qualify for. So you get an owner-occupant loan, you can still rent out up to the other three units. And in terms of the lending that you need, in terms of the down payment that you need, that is the the lowest barrier to entry to getting started. And I agree with too that this is the best. Well, we talked about this on a show too. This one, our uh, March Madness, not to ruin the surprise episode, but also a lot of people don't know when you want to do like your first home as a home hack too, you qualify for programs. That first place that I bought, it was no money down. I qualified by income to have a no money down. And a lot of the programs, as long as it's residential, like Paula just said, four units or below, you can get money down payment assistance so i didn't have to put money down i got money back at the closing Shh, don't tell my mom but i got money back <laughs> at the closing to actually buy that property i ended up the money that i did put down i got it back at closing because they're like hey you qualify for a program for buying this your first property the government wants you to buy property that's just another case for real estate You know, uh, there were four real estate investors on that show. Crystal, you do part-time. Your co-host, Alan Corey, who 300 and and how many doors does he have? Yeah. 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 Over 340 or 80s by now. Yes. Uh, And then- uh, And we had Mindy Jensen from Bigger Pockets. Tom Brickman. From Frugal Gay. Yes. Yes. Who were on on that episode. People want to go back and listen to 16 different uh, ways to buy property. And then you guys have them all go head to head. Second is long-term rentals. Len, this seems like an easy way to also get started. Buy a house, rent it out to somebody long-term. Sounds like something you could even do. Yeah. And I think- Even the, Len could do it. It's so easy. Even well, Len I could, could do it. You know what? If you hit the lottery, right? So uh, my father-in-law rented for many years, and he was one of those great tenants that I think every landlord loves. He would do all the maintenance work, and he would- the guy was on time with his payments and because he was such a good tenant, you know, his rent never went up in like 15 years. His, his landlord appreciated him so much. If I could get a tenant like that, I would definitely do it. But I, I'm afraid I would get the tenant that would squat on the place and then it would take me two years to evict him. And so that way, that's, that's why I would just stay out. But boy, if you could get a great tenant, I couldn't think of anything better than a long-term rent. Well, it's just gravy. The, the money would be coming in. I made all the mistakes. I also was very uneducated, but, and I had uh, two different tenants and I had one of each of those, Len. I had one that was absolutely mm-hmm. horrible and one that fixed everything. If I could get the one that fixed everything, that would be great. Great. Well, now they do, they have people in places that they, that's their specialty is helping find great tenants. Cause I always used a realtor. I already knew I didn't want to do screening. I didn't want to do showings and stuff like that. So I happily paid a realtor. And also that's what insurance is for too. Just insure yourself against bad tenants. Um, if you want extra peace of mind, get extra, you know. So there are ways to, I'm just, you know, still selling real so estate. So let me ask you, Crystal, uh, how important is credit? I hear credit scores for renting is very important. 
Uh, like if you want to rent, is that true or is that not true? I think it's true because evictions would show up on a credit. But I've had an eviction actually, and I'm a homeowner. And way early in college days, I was evicted. So it happens to good people, bad people. That's why you have to be, you know, a good judge. And I outsourced it to someone who reads that stuff better than I can. So right now, I don't trust myself trying to find tenants. I happily pay my realtor that I love mm. to help me find tenants. So just outsource the stuff you don't want to do. Like you don't have to be a handyman. You don't have to be a numbers person. You don't have to be an accountant. You know, you can have someone else do all the numbers. You can have someone else do all the tenant but screening, think, all the cleaning. Yeah, but I think everybody's got to, you, you have to realize that takes money off the top. And then the difference between right. that and just buying yep. an index fund becomes even less, right? I mean, I, I start looking at, okay, I buy this place. I, I get rid of all the cash flow because I hand it over to all these professionals. And then why didn't I just buy an index fund? And then another thing, you can have your own property management company. Why don't you pay yourself in a property management company, but you're, you you still have your employees? So that doesn't mean it's not you. It means it's your property management company. We would recommend this is a hack for people paying kids way through college. If you happen to own a house in the college town, have your child be your property manager. Now they would have to do the work, but instead of paying directly for the tuition, you would pay them and they would pay the tuition. So instead of paying the tuition at mom and dad's rate, all of a sudden the tuition's being paid at the, at the kid's rate. They have to do the work though. Paul, I want to ask you about this. For long-term rentals, Ari writes, the location is key. You need to choose areas with strong rental markets, considering factors like job growth. He really spends a lot of time on location being key. Do you think that's the main key if you're going into long-term rentals? Location is key, but I don't think job growth is necessarily what you're looking for. What you're looking for, first and foremost, is the price to rent ratio, meaning what are the prices of properties in that area and what do they rent for and what, what is the relationship between them in a place like Manhattan, New York. Oh, New York, the New York one. Yes, yes. In, in the Manhattan, other one. The other one. Exactly. Versus Manhattan, Kansas. Yeah, the one we all think of first. Yes. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you're going to have very different price to rent ratios. And that means that the relative attractiveness of those properties as an investment, I haven't looked at the Manhattan, Kansas numbers, but I'm going to guess that Manhattan, Kansas is most likely a more attractive place to own a long-term investment from a landlord's perspective than Manhattan, New York, um, precisely because of the price to rent ratio. So that's what you want to be searching for. But being a college town, that may be different than a lot of other towns in Kansas. It could be. Again, I haven't looked at Manhattan, yeah. Kansas. Yeah. I, I, I'm not knowledgeable specifically about Manhattan, Kansas. But just because a, I'm using that as an example to highlight that just because a particular town isn't the next Miami or the next Austin, right? It doesn't have to be the next big tech hub um, or the next like sexy crypto destination. <laughs> you simply need a stable enough population so such that you will find renters, right? You can't have a city that people are fleeing from in droves, but you need a stable enough population. And then beyond that, you need a good price to rent ratio. Let's go over the next one. Stick with you for a second, Paula. Fix and flip. Good for a beginner? Jeez. Uh, no. No, absolutely not. I think that's a terrible idea for a beginner. Why is that? Whew. Okay, when you are when you're a buy and hold investor, if I make a $10,000 mistake, but I'm going to hold that property for 30 years, my $10,000 mistake is going to be amortized over the 30 years I hold that property, which means in the long term, it's not going to be so bad. When you are in the fix and flip game, you're going to hold a property for a very short period of time, maybe three, four, or five months. During that period of time, you have renovation costs, you have holding costs. Holding costs include the cost of paying the, the loan on the property while you have it, the cost of capital, you have, all, you have insurance costs, you have all property kinds of taxes. bills. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Prorated property taxes that you have to pay. There are, in addition to just the renovation costs, which is what everybody thinks about, there are a lot of holding costs that people don't often think about, but that are present. And on top of that, you're also paying transaction costs, both at the buy and the sell side. Now, if you yourself have a real estate license, then sure, you might be able to get around that by paying yourself. You know, but, but still, with the transaction costs and the holding costs and the reno costs, it's very easy for your margins to get squeezed down to zero or down into negative territory. And because you don't have the benefit of time on your side, right, 
doing something that's uh, short, the short time horizon is far less forgiving. Well, and I, and I also think crystal that, you know, how many times have you and Alan talked about having a great team in place? If you're brand new, you haven't had time to get that team in place. Like you're, you're going to make a mistake picking your contractors. There's no way. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend the flip to new investors because you do. You need way too many people because you do. You need an an amazing inspector that's going to find everything that you're going to need fixed. Then you're going to need like the electrician, plumber, contract. Like there's so many people you're going to need that. And it's such a small time frame to find them. Like Paula said, you're making mortgage payments in this time that no one's living there. And another thing, like uh, that's one thing I hate when I'm watching these fix and flip shows is true. They have this glorified. First of all, they have this camera crew. They have found perfect crews and they have all these outtakes of, you know, that's why they're there's they're such a seamless process. Then they'll be like, oh, yeah, we did this um, 180 day flip and we made four thousand dollars. And I'm like, that's not even a lot of money to make within that time frame. So after they pay all those costs, it's like they're like a temporary holding place for all this cash that goes out to all these other people. I, I wouldn't recommend a flip for a beginner like a no one. Len, it, 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 and this seems like something that'd be on the Len Penzo blog because it just seems like f- for a beginner you watch these shows the crystals talk about like the property brothers or love it or list it or or any of these shows they just make it Len look so easy who are the people in Waco um uh the oh, Gaines Chip and Joanna Gaines yeah Chip and Joanna I mean they show these houses and it just looks like Hey, I could do this. It feels kind of like a trap for a beginner more than an opportunity. Yeah, and it's happening a lot because you know what? These some of these flipping shows now they're actually showing flipping shows where people are getting into trouble. I think because it's happening more frequently. I I can't think of the names of the shows that are out there, but there are those and it's just um they make it look so easy. And if you look really close, some of this they're doing so fast. They they're doing these renos so fast the craftsmanship if you look real closely, it's really not that mm-hmm. good. They are trying so hard to flip something so fast. Yep. And I just don't think, you know, in a really fast rising market, you can get away with that. But when things start to slow down, I think buyers will start recognizing that and demand better quality work. So there's that risk as well. We just had uh, Jonathan Clements on the show on Monday and uh, a story from his book that he just released was from a certified financial planner who bought a house and found out that the people, Len, to your point, that had bought the house were flippers. And a lot of the, there was so much structural damage that they did not realize when they bought the house. Even their inspector did not find the, the structure. Well, there's a lot of people that they're buying, I don't think not so much anymore, but a couple of years ago, people were buying houses sight unseen. Mm-hmm. They were just buying the house. And then they would find out, oh, my God, what did I just buy here? The house it needs a complete run of, you know, like you said, yeah. the, the foundation's cracked or something ridiculous, you know, and then they've really got themselves in a mess. So, yeah, I mean, it's one thing to be a pro and invest. And it's another thing to think, oh, I can do this. And because these shows make it look so easy and then you get into a whole lot of trouble. I, you do a stock, a stock fund or something, you can get out with a lot less <laughs> pain. Whereas if you do something in real estate and you make a mistake, like, I mean, to Paul, what Paula said, if you're going to hold it for 30 years, you amortize the losses. But uh, boy, it can be very painful. And this is just the thing, like we're recommending not starting here as a beginner, but as a pro, you have more tools. Like you have more people, you know, behind your back that, you know, can fix things. And a pro will know how to negotiate because they can buy a place on scene and they know no matter how bad the foundation is or no matter, you know, how bad X, Y, Z is. I know how to fix it at a certain price point where I'm buying it right and it's going to be an amazing deal. Yeah. And then to Paula's point up front, this is a professional job. Right. This not is my new, job. Right. Not I'm a not beginner. Walk, yes. Yeah. I'm not walking in here having watched a few uh, <laughs> episodes of Love It or List It. From the <laughs> right. couch. Yeah. Right. You're not well, a couch. So, and again, it goes back to that analogy of like, you don't watch the Indy 500 on TV and think to yourself, mm-hmm. I have a driver's license. Again. You know, so I can be a professional race car driver too. Right. Just because you have a profession, just because you have a driver's license and you can drive your own car for your own personal use does not make you a professional driver, no matter how much TV you watch. Are you looking right at him while you say this, Paul? (laughs) Because, again, Doug thinks that. 
You're crushing Doug his Ruth ego. Doug would like to have a drive. Uh, you know what? We should let Doug drive for one episode <laughs> instead of having Ruth, the realtor, drive us. <laughs> you I'd would love cover to hear a that. lot more territory. <laughs> <laughs> for people that don't listen to Stacking Deeds, Ruth, the realtor, is taking them around looking at uh, looking at rental properties. And Doug's in the trunk as the yeah. narrator on that show as well. Uh, Len, do you stay at Airbnbs? You ever you ever stayed at Airbnb versus staying in a hotel? Yes, I actually I have. I I, I've, I guess do you, does it technically count as an Airbnb? I stayed at um, Greg McFarland's place. Actually, I, I can't remember if he was using it as a, I think he was at, at the time out there in Maui that he used to have. He no longer has it. But yes, I did I he gouge you? Did he gouge you? <laughs> uh, actually, no, no, he did not. I'm not even going to joke about that. No, he gave me a great deal. He was what a good guy he was. That's very nice. Paul, did you stay at Greg's place too? I stayed at his place in Las Vegas, not his place in Hawaii. So Greg making money off uh, a bunch of the Stacking Benjamins team. <laughs> well, actually, he let me stay at his place for free. So. Oh, Ooh. nice. Oh, hey, wait. Awesome. Well, that's a better deal than I got. <laughs> Jeez. I take it back. You can see where you rate, Len. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so let's end this then with short-term vacation properties. Uh, Crystal, back to you. Uh, for a beginner, do you go into the short-term vacation property? I think it's a big learning curve, but it's doable. We had Lauren Keen Amond on, and we had another expert at this. I'm not an expert at the short-term rentals, and I don't have an Airbnb account. I've stayed at other people's Airbnbs, but I've never like been moved to like I I, I like hotels. But as an investment strategy, I think you need to know the rules because some condo associations, they don't allow it. Some neighborhoods, they don't allow it. I know there are, are a lot of rules. A lot of people don't love them. So if you're going to get into this, it is a great way to make money, but just make sure you know the rules. So that way you're buying something that you know. So just know the rules is what piece of advice I'd give for the short term properties. It just feels like, well, and Lauren Keene listening to her talk about all the tools she uses and how she does it again, not going in there without a bunch of, I mean, she's got a whole system for how she does it. And Paula, I feel like this is competing. You're not competing against long-term landlords. You're not competing against Marriott, you know, Marriott kind of knows what they're doing. I just, I look at short-term vacation properties and if I'm going back into real estate, it's, I don't know, fix it and flip. It's probably the last one. This is the next to last one I go into. Mm. So I used to be what's referred to as a super host on Airbnb. Well, uh, do you know host. who I am? <laughs> wow. <laughs> super host is simply a designation that they give to somebody once they've uh, achieved X number of visits. Uh, you know, they've hosted X number of guests in Y increment of time, and they have an average of Z star rating. So um, that's funny because I've been I was listed as a super pest, which meant I was kicked out of many of those. So super Uber, pest. Uber won't even pick up Len anymore because his review on Uber is so bad. Yeah. But I say that because I can speak from experience. Being a short term rental host is complete apples and oranges from being a long term buy and hold uh, rental property owner, landlord. Owning a rental property is analogous to owning a commodity, whereas being a short-term rental host, an Airbnb or a VRBO host, is analogous to being in the hospitality industry, right? Mm. So, Joe, when you were talking about Marriott, you're absolutely correct. Hosting an Airbnb is comparable to competing against a hotel. You're competing against Marriott, against Hilton, you know, and certainly you're offering something that's a little bit more boutique. But you are still creating a nightly guest experience. For example, you are responsible for making sure that the toilet paper is properly stocked. Toilet paper, dish soap, paper towels, kitchen sponges, soap, shampoo, right? Like those are the not quarter things. machine next to the bed. <laughs> hey, hey, Paula, Paula, did Greg supply you with toilet paper at your place? Because I, when I was... Uh-oh. Was it BYO, BYOTP? BYOTP. He really likes her better. <laughs> right. If you are a landlord, your tenants are not calling you to say, um, I can't find the ironing board. But mm -hmm. you get that when you're a short-term rental host. That's why we're talking about such completely separate industries that it is a reflection of the writer's lack of knowledge that they this, that this writer would even list those mm. in the same article. 
that does not make any sense. That is like saying that because you can talk into a microphone as a podcaster, that's analogous to singing into a microphone as a professional singer. Sure, we're using the same tool. We're that's using a, the same that's microphone. That's a bridge too far right there. <laughs> Back that trolley up, sister. I can karaoke. <laughs> Let's go, Crystal. Let's go. You ever had three beers down at the Sizzler? I'm all about the karaoke. I can sing them. I can sing amazing after three beers at the Sizzler. Just, yeah. Nobody's told me that. I just know. Right. I do. I think that's a great place to wrap this up because I also think real estate can be fantastic. It just, for a beginner, I'm glad that we, Mm -hmm. we, I think all of you really nailed the point. There is a lot to know versus, I think, Lund, to your point, you can get into an index fund and maybe just lose a little money. You know, and you lose it with a lot less time invested than you do if you own property. We'll link to this piece on our show notes page. We're also going to link to what all of you are doing. We'll have our guest of honor go last, but let's talk about what's going on at lempenzo.com. Wait, I'm not the guest of honor. What does that say? I'm <laughs> telling you. <laughs> Again. <laughs> He's like, he gets no respect from Greg. He gets no respect from Joe. By the way, I don't charge Paula to be on the show either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, at lenpenzo.com, this week we're talking about finding unclaimed money. You might have, I, you know, I don't know if you know this, but lots of people have hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of dollars in accounts that they've completely forgotten about or refunds or what have you. They're just sitting there waiting to be claimed. And there are actually websites where you can go check out if you have some money waiting for you. And I list all these websites you can go check. I found $185,000 waiting for me in unclaimed funds. So uh, I figured I want to share that with you guys. Wait, 185000 wow. No, not really. But I, I was hoping that would just <laughs> entice everybody else to show up to my... Goodness. Len, I was actually thinking the opposite. I'm like, how dumb are you to misplace 180,000 bucks? Because <laughs> I would no, surely I actually had notice. zero dollars. <laughs> I had zero dollars, but but there was an Enzo Penzo or somebody like that named close to my name that, that had some money uh, waiting for them, but uh, not me. Old Cousin Enzo. Yeah. You should let Cousin Enzo know and just take like a 15% cut. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? It's Find like your, f- yeah, right, Crystal. Uh, Paula, what's going on with the Afford Anything podcast? On the Afford Anything podcast, we talked to Stanford economist Nick Bloom about work from home, remote work. Um, so he talks about how that's affecting real estate, how it's affecting productivity, creativity, collaboration, how it affects your happiness at work, at home, in your life. So that's on the Afford Anything podcast. Plus, Joe, you and I answer questions that come from the community. And soon, you and I are putting our faces on YouTube for answering those questions. Didn't have to scare everybody by telling them my face was going to be on there. Trying to break YouTube. (laughs) (laughs) I think people will be able to tell which is which very, (laughs) very quickly. Yeah. Paula, also, you do a real estate course. Is there some way people can get on a waiting list? Can they get information? Yes, absolutely. So I have a course. It's called Your First Rental Property. It is, as the name implies, for beginner rental property investors. And we offer the course typically twice a year. We don't know exactly when we're going to be offering it this year, uh, probably in in a couple of months. But there's a wait list, uh, affordanything.com slash VIP list. So you can go there, you can join the wait list and find out when we will be releasing it next. And Crystal, thanks so much for finally being on a roundtable episode. It's been too long. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was fun. So what is coming up on the Stacking Deeds podcast? So coming up, um, we have an episode where Alan and I are just talking on tips on how people buy their first piece of real estate property. And we have a round table also coming up because a lot of people, if they're going to buy an older property, we ha- we brought some handymen and women on to talk, you know, expenses and, you know, timelines of what needs to be fixed and things like that. So, and then we, Joe's done an interview that that'll be coming up on one of our episodes too. We can't wait to show that one, share that I one. I can't too. wait for people to hear that one. All of that detail and never once did she mention that I was going to be there too. <laughs> oh, how can we forget That's our right. VIP, our VIP special guest? Every episode is Doug. All that and Doug. 
All that. That's a Stacking Deeds podcast. And Doug. That's it. That's all it takes. I'm not asking for much. There it is. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, thank you so much, Crystal, Paula, Len, for hanging out. Thanks to everybody hanging out with us today. I think that's where we're going to leave it. Doug, I think you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from our panel and take advantage of real estate investing to build your wealth. Just be sure to educate yourself before diving in. Second, if you're thinking of jumping in the game for the first time, consider house hacking with four or fewer units. There, can, there are a number of government programs that can help you get started and avoid falling into the Lenpenzo math. But the big lesson? The real estate thing can be tricky if you're trying to find a good tenant. Pro tip, don't advertise your property while the carnival's in town. Stinky the Clown has a different sense of personal space than you do. Trust me. Thanks to Crystal Hammond for joining us today. You can find her new podcast, Stacking Deeds, wherever the finest podcasts are found. The finest! We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks to Len Penzo for joining us today. You can find Len at lenpenzo.com slash slumlord. <laughs> Thanks also to Paula Pant for joining us today. You can find Paula's podcast, Afford Anything, where you're listening to us right now. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihat. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lacey Langford, who's also the host of The Military Money Show, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Yunkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So, say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Welcome to the after show. Uh, Len, we're recording this about a week before people hear it. What did you do Father's Day weekend? I did absolutely nothing. I, I, I sat home and and uh, watched golf. You didn't That's grill? That's it. What a lazy Yes, person. actually, well, I did. I did grill, yes, after the golf was over. Oh, okay. I did grill. Yeah, but Crystal, is dad supposed to grill Crystal yeah. or is somebody supposed to grill for dad? The dads all get together and grill. Like in Chicago, that's what <laughs> my family does. All the dads get together and grill in the park. Isn't that cool? And by the way, the the noise in the background that people are hearing, they're wondering what's going on. Is Paula doing surgery on her equipment <laughs> as we're recording this before we record the episode? Because apparently Paula Pants never podcasted before. I think she needs a hammer. I don't know yeah. if she can hear us. I can totally hear you. Hear <laughs> I couldn't realize you could also hear the sound of me trying to like shuffle cables around. You yes. were muted when you didn't want to be muted. And not muted. When you should <laughs> have been blank muted. out the video, but we can still hear you. Um, I still don't seem to be coming through the mic, and I don't no. know why. You do not. <laughs> we know why because you have it hooked up wrong.
Control out. Is delete. the microphone on? Is the oh, yeah. on switch on the microphone? I didn't turn my on switch. I don't think there is one on, how, the, on the mic that Paul and I use. I don't know that there is a separate. How great would that be, though? On. I think that would be great if if the microphone just weren't. Have you on. tried plugging it and unplugging it? <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I'm. You doing. guys remember the old <laughs> the old microphones that came with those tape recorders? Like when you were a kid, did you ever have a tape oh, recorder? Yeah. We used yeah, to have the, the old. You could wear it. You can yeah. You can strap the whole <laughs> tape recorder and carry He's it around. He's going a little further back than that, Crystal. Oh, the the tape recorder. They had the carry. Yeah. We've been recording I, for two minutes and Len already has the old guy I, microphone I story. I you that the one Len is thinking of. Hey, you know, I was a precursor to the podcast. I used to do little shows on the microphone. I mean, on the tape recorders when I was a kid. We would record shows. On I the, did too. Did you do that? Uh-uh. We had this baseball board game like uh, uh, Status Pro Baseball and organized it into different teams. And my brother and I would call the games. <laughs> As we were fun. playing it. That's awesome. And we made fake commercials and the whole the whole. Do you deal. still have the tapes? Ta- no. Oh, <laughs> man. That would be worth something. That would be good. How would you play them? Yes, exactly, Crystal. Yeah, Even if you have you those tapes, them? you'd have nothing to play them on anymore. I put it put it back in my hey, Walkman. Hold on there, Doug. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, right. Your Walkman. I still play my music. I have albums on cassette tapes. You get eight track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. I had pocket rockers. Pocket rocker, the place. Hey, this is a family show, Crystal. Feel the beat. No, <laughs> come <we're> on. <laughs> They were like the mini, mini music players. Oh, yes. Nobody, oh, that yeah, thing. See? The pocket rock. I do remember that. See? But that was a thing for like a minute, though. Yeah, I mean, seriously. One song at a time. For, oh, yeah, it didn't last. Yes. But like a year or two yeah. years. I was I, on that. Bike. I remember seeing those and going, is anybody going to buy those? And the answer was Crystal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. I had to save up. Well, we were a Betamax family, too. We didn't go with the VHS. Oh, really? We see how that turned out. Always been on the cutting edge, huh? Did we have Crystal, a Pontiac too? I'm trying to remember. Crystal, did you have the big boom box or are you not old enough for that? Yeah, I had boom box. Yeah, did you? Yeah. I had one in my first car because my first car never had a radio. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> I, I do not know what is going on with my mic. I, I went from coming in hot to not coming in at all. You always come in hot, Paula. You don't, that does oh, much regardless. God, of, she teed <laughs> that up for you. Oh, my oh. God. She was waiting for someone to <laughs> no. take a swing at that. <laughs> I like how Paula slowed down for it too. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. wait, <laughs> <laughs> just set how, it up. How bad is it? Coming oh, it's pretty. It, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Can you reboot? Reboot. Um, yeah, let me, yeah. Uh, with, with your let me mic try. plugged in, right. so that it might recognize yeah. it. Control Alt Delete. Throw it out the window and pick it up from downstairs. <laughs> Throw it out the window. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. All right, let me let me try. Yes. Let me hang up and just class. kick it in the side. Again. Kick the side. We got nothing but time policy. (laughs) 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 Joe, for uh, another five minute piece of technology that, you know, I give you all the time about how you owned multiple Microsoft Zunes. (laughs) I remember that. Yeah. I mean, he he doubled down on it. He bought a second one. But anyway, uh, I had the Sony mini disc. Do you remember that? The mi- yes, yes, I do it was like remember the mini disc. 94 through 98. Yes. But it was the only digital recording back then. We did buy, when I was a DJ, we bought um, CD singles. Oh, we yeah. had some CD yes, singles. I remember like those too. Little CDs yes. this big. DJ yeah. Saul C. High? What was your DJ Saul C. High. What was it? It was Jazzy Joe. It was, I was a. Jazzy Joe. DJ Jazzy, Jazzy, Jazzy Joe. All right, Lynn, you have to think of a name. Wiki, wiki, wiki. And then we see who was the right, who was most correct. It was funny. Uh, it was actually fun. Okay, yes. Yes. All right. And then I'll tell you the story of the DJ name I didn't have that I wanted. And everybody told me, no, you can't do it. And then this dude came out with the same damn name and was huge. Really? Yes. Yeah, think of a name, Lynn. You got to think of a name. Fitty. Fifty, <laughs> fifty cent, yeah. Jay Z had to be money related, right? Except mine was the white guy version. It was fifty. <laughs> you enunciate every syllable. Yeah, right. Fifty. <laughs> Gotta enunciate. <laughs> Let's get this party started, everybody. <laughs> oh shucks! I'm your main man, fifty. Yeah. Yay. Oh. Oh, amazing. Thank you. Th- 
Thank you. Thank you. I'm Who'd a... you like to thank? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was going to be college boy. College boy. I was uh. like, oh, God, you can't do that. I was in college. I was DJing all these basement parties and fraternity parties. Hmm. It was college boy. And everybody's like, no, that's stupid. That's dumb. And then there was a huge, there was a huge DJ on Sirius XM that, that they would play. And he was DJ college boy. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. everybody. Hmm. Crystal, uh, I was also a DJ in high school and college. And my, I dated a girl in Chicago in college. And I remember being up there and we went to, we ended up going to some club she was talking about how, like, this is the best DJ I've ever heard. And I'm, I'm standing next to her. I'm like, uh, I'm a what DJ. And she looks right at me with all her friends around, dead ass serious, and said, I mean, a real DJ. Oh. <laughs> Just crushed me. <laughs> she wasn't wrong. What was your DJ name? She was name? not wrong. She was not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 